Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to day three of the annual KCNI summer school. That is the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics. Um, today we're gonna we're gonna jump into some biology. Uh, we're kind of getting it started. We're starting with the multi-level neuroinformatics. We've had fantastic, really important uh, information over the last couple of days of clinical information, background of major depression, the general kind of clinical experience um, from clinicians, super important background on all kinds of ethical considerations um, for study design, for considering how we interpret research, how we uh, go about uh, ingesting research and understanding it. And now we're going to talk about genes and uh, and who better than the two of us <laughs> at Casey and I. Why don't we introduce ourselves? Um, before we do that, uh, we're going to do a couple of really important things. Um, first of which is the uh, uh, land acknowledgement, because it's really important to recognize that CAMH, where, where we all work, our hospital is situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia. And these are lands that are rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine and architecture and technology, extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. Um, and in the 186, in, in 1860, it was the site of CAMH appeared in the Colonial Records Office of the British Crown um, as the council grounds of the Mississauga of New Credit, uh, as they were known at the time. And today, Toronto is covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty Number 13 of 1805 with the Mississauga of the Credit. And Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit and Métis who enrich the city. And so CAMH is committed to reconciliation and we will honour the land through programs and places that reflect and respect its heritage. And we will embrace the healing traditions of American of, of the ancestors uh, and weave them into our caring practices. And we will create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis and share the land and protect it for future generations. Um, also, uh, just to remind everyone, I know we're all here to learn um, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't have any problems with this, but, you know, sometimes it does happen. So we just want to remind everyone this is a, a diverse place. It's a respectful place. Everyone, uh, again, is, is just here to learn and participate. So we, we won't tolerate any, any kind of harassment in any form uh, throughout this entire course. And again, this is a thing that we're, we're keep hammering in. This is important, even you know, working in mental health and uh, psychiatry and neurology, working in healthcare for a very long time, you can forget this. And, and, and it helps to continually be reminded that when we refer to people um, and when, when discussing mental health, we refer to the person first. So rather than depressives or schizophrenics, it's people who are affected by these disorders, people with major depressive disorder, people suffering from schizophrenia. Don't, don't feel shame, don't shame others about this. We all make mistakes sometimes, but you, you only, you know, when you recognize it and you think about it, then, you know, you'll, you'll make less of the mistakes in the future and start thinking about how you uh, speak to people who are affected by these conditions, which are incredibly prevalent. So I'll remind you where we are. Um, day three, genomics, or I guess genetics and transcriptomics, so that we'll kind of start at the bottom ladder here of neuroinformatics, the, the lower part of the, uh, the scale of where we're kind of building things up. So it can't get much smaller than, than genes in the genome. Uh, and to uh, kind of go over what we'll do today, I'm going to start off the morning session now with some basics of genotype. Um, what is genotype? How do we measure it? I'm going to talk about something we refer to as the central dogma, link it to the next levels up. Uh, and then discuss something with this unhelpful acronym GWAS, the GWAS, the Genome Wide Association Study, which is a um, central part, kind of like the, the foundation of a lot of our uh, genomic and, and um, polygenic, more modern approaches to, uh, to looking at genetic risk. And then I'll talk about polygenic risk scores, which you may have heard about. I'll make you literate in these concepts. Uh, Shrijoy is then going to go on to transcriptomics and kind of the next step up from genotype what happens from that. Um, the slides are very small, Fernanda, I can see in the chat. I've, I'm just, I, I apologize. I, perhaps I should have done the focus on, I wanted to, I wanted to show our faces because, you know, especially for chatting and, um, you know, doing the basic introductions, I think having our live faces is nice, but yes, I apologize. The slides are very small. Um, hopefully they're bigger now. I've, I've put them into focus. 
So the, the, the second session in the morning will be transcriptomics and, uh, and Sri Joe will talk about single cell transcriptomics, which um, are kind of the, you know, the vanguard of this, uh, this type of technology, really important uh, insights being derived from that. And then the afternoon, a couple of workshops led by a uh, very talented postdoc, Sunny Chen, as well as a, a graduate student in Sri Joe's lab, Kion Arbabi. Um, and we'll learn more about those uh, in the next sessions. Um, to introduce ourselves, so there's the static pictures to complement now our little thumbnails in the bottom. Dr. Sridroy Tripathi is the head of computational genomics at KCNI. He's affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry and Physiology at U of T, and he has a background in computational neuroscience uh, as well as uh, neuroinformatics and bioinformatics. Uh, myself, I'm the head of whole person modeling. Um, I'm, I'm dabbling in today um, because of my, my background and interest in genetics. I'll, I'll be appearing next week as well to talk about uh, some other methodologies. And my background uh, is in uh, also kind of in neuroimaging and genetics, combining genetics with other types of uh, measurements in Alzheimer's disease and also in bioinformatics and immunology. Um, so, so kind of the, the genetic focused crew here. Our, our talented TAs for the day will be um, Sunny Chen, Dr. Sunny Chen, uh, Michaela Consens, who is a uh, incoming PhD student. Well, actually she's outgoing. She's leaving us to start a PhD, but uh, uh, she's been with us for a couple of years. Uh, Amin Karagani, who's a master's student in, in my lab at the Dalalana School of Public Health, and then Kian Arbabi, um, a PhD student in, in, in uh, Sri Joy's lab. And again, you'll be hearing from Sunny and Kian in the afternoon. So feel free to reach out to them in the Slack chat that we have going on. Um, feel free. John Griffiths is telling me that my face is at least as pretty when it's in a small box than when it is in a large one. Thank you so much, John. You know, we're, we're paying attention. Um, that's, that's really nice of you to say. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, reach out to them, reach out to us, Slack channel in the chat, uh, keep it lively. And uh, also we'll have the gather town uh, open between sessions during breaks and at lunch as well for more interaction. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna jump into it. So please remember you can leave questions uh, in the question box. Uh, that's uh, at the bottom, there's a ask a question, you can answer a question, people can upvote your questions, and I will get to them at natural breaks in the talk, and also before the break, I'm hoping to leave a few minutes uh, for discussion on any of these topics, so you can track your questions in that, in that uh, box. So let's go ahead. Um, we saw a little bit um, about genetics was kind of hinted to during Victor's talk on day one about heritability. And indeed what we're gonna focus on today um, is all about heritability. It's all about how we look at the material that's passed down through generations and how that results in, in risk for uh, psychiatric illness. And we're gonna focus again on major depressive disorder, which was our clinical focus from, from day one. And we heard more about it yesterday, but we're, we're also gonna try to keep the theme of major depression as, as a focus, not exclusive focus, but the focus as we move up uh, the, the, the scales um, uh, over, over the next several days. So if we look back at major depression, we heard it's about 40% heritability. We, we say this word heritability, what do we mean? And it's simply the, the component of the, the burden of disease risk that's attributable to genetics alone. So you imagine, you know, b before you are, before you're born, your risk for developing major depression has already been determined at about 40%. Is 40% of that risk you can't do anything about. Uh, and this is knowledge that we have. This is uh, data that we, that we have from a long history of research, family-based research and twin studies in, in psychiatry, uh, where we look at the simply the, the nature of the relationship between people, first degree parents, cousins, or twins, twins who are monozygotic, who shared the same um, you know, share the same genetic material or dizygotic who, who don't share the same material, but were kind of born in this or developed in the same womb. And we can identify what portion of those people go on to develop major depressive disorder. And then through how close or far apart they are, identify how much is heritable. Um, and, and this kind of shows where major depression lands in a more recent review um, 
And it shows where major depression lands in, in relation to a lot of other psychiatric illnesses. You can see that the lifetime prevalence on the left side shows you know, anxiety disorders are quite prevalent in society. Schizophrenia further down below is about 1% prevalence. Major depression is, is quite prevalent, um, over 15% in the general population. And B is showing very similar data to what I just showed on the previous slide. You know, these twin family-based studies showing heritability around 40%. Um, for major depressive disorder. And then we have this thing on the right side, um, which is called SNP-based heritability. And, and you're gonna become familiar with SNPs over the next hour uh, or so, and, and try to understand what these are. And, and uh, it's uh, choosing them as a focus because there are many types of genetic variability. There are a lot of um, differences between our genome that we could look at, but the most commonly looked at and something that accounts for a major portion of measurable genetic variability between individuals is something called SNPs. It stands for single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we can estimate the heritability uh, that's due to just this part of genetic differences. And it's a little bit less than the 40% you can see. It's, it's almost about half of variability is explained by what I'm about to show you. Um, a very complicated, strange looking circular figure. Uh, this is our state of the art for what we know about uh, genetics, the, the location of where risk is in our human genome for developing major depressive disorder or for self-report depression or for depressive symptoms as measured by a, a, a health questionnaire. The reason why this is a kind of three-tiered target um, is, is that this is actually from a very recent study just published in Nature Neuroscience. Uh, where they ran three separate genome-wide association studies. Um, they had a sample of over 1.2 million people. It was actually a meta-analysis. This uh, was in European ancestry, but they also looked at individuals who had African-American or who were African-American, but therefore were genetically identified as having African ancestry, which is very important. And they identified a SNP-based heritability of about 11.3%. So about 11.3, they, they were able to explain just based on this data type and this analysis, about 11.3% of the risk, the total risk for developing major depression. Remember, this is totally agnostic of any life events that have happened, any of your you know, childhood, current events, what you're eating, how you're sleeping. This is just based on very simple, one type of genetic variation, measurable even before you're born, germline genetic variation. I, I can unwrap this figure for you. And what I'm actually just gonna do is unfold the top layer of this, which is the these international disease codes, ICD-10 major depressive disorder codes, which come from electronic health records. This is the result of a meta-analysis. It looks perhaps a little more familiar, maybe not, I can orient you. The numbers on the bottom are the human chromosomes, the autosomes, not including X and Y sex chromosomes or the mitochondrial genome, which is actually a separate little circle of DNA that is in your mitochondria. So this is the, basically the nuclear genome minus the sex chromosomes. And the way you can interpret this plot is every single one of these dots, and there are millions of dots on this, on this figure, each one of them is one position on the human genome where there is a potential to have a difference between uh, one person or another, a single letter difference, this single nucleotide polymorphism. And and, and the plot is showing their location on the genome on the x-axis and on the y-axis, this is a negative log p-value. You can think of it as the strength of evidence for association with major depression. So the higher up that dot is, the more strongly it's associated with major depression. And I'll show you exactly what that means um, as we go through a description of, of genotyping. Um, this bottom uh, little piece of the figure shows just kind of the complexity of what goes into designing a study like this, kind of the modern genome-wide association, the modern GWAS era, you need a lot of people, and you need a lot of people who have, who have you know, electronic health records available, or who have self-reported depressive symptoms by, by a survey, or, or who have completed a PHQ, um, uh, it's a PHQ-9 survey, but there are two questions on it that are related to depressive symptoms specifically. Uh, and they looked at people from the MVP sample, which is a million veterans project, 23andMe. So if you participate in 23andMe, you can have your data available. Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, the FinGen Consortium, to trying to get, you know, the, the Finland is very interesting because they have bio, you know, national biobanks and a healthcare system to collect information on virtually everyone. They're, they're putting together a huge database of information. Also the United Kingdom Biobank, the UK Biobank. So 
very large amount of data. Again, this final top meta analysis is data from, from you know, 1.1 million people. Um, and they've identified 178 of these loci, so the ones that are highlighted in purple all pass some threshold for significance. We'll talk about what that means. Basically, again, the higher up the dot is, the more strongly it's associated with major depression. So you need a lot of people to statistically see these differences and kind of put that in perspective for you. And I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but it's, it's kind of just within the genomic world, right? This is the first step, GWAS, identify the positions on the genome that are associated with your disorder and then there's other, there are many steps to take. There are many ways in which genetic variation can affect the functional architecture of the genome. We'll talk about that. Uh, and, and many ways in which that, that kind of is the, you know, one of the initial starting points for downstream cascades that go on to affect cells and goes on to affect the development of cells and the function of cells. And in the context of the brain, the way that cells communicate with each other. And we'll hear about that in the coming days. So genetic variation in genotyping, I've shown you these big plots, I've talked about millions of genetic variants. What are we really talking about? Can we, can we get a more, uh, more in-depth understanding of, of what's actually happening? Uh, you know, let's go back to, uh, you know, back to first year. Um, we're talking about human genetics and we're talking about how, you know, what, what we're composed of in terms of our genetic material in all of the cells in our body. Uh, we are a diploid organism. This means we have two copies of each of our chromosomes in all of our ce cells at any given time. We inherit half of that from our mother, half of that from our father into the fertilized egg. You can see this plot on the, the left side is actually a visualization of, of the human genome, basically just from one cell. Um, but it includes the X and Y chromosomes here, and then you have two copies of all the chromosomes, one to 22, and they basically just get smaller. They, they get kind of shorter as you go up to 22. Uh, and that contains all the information, or almost all the information that's needed to turn a, a single egg, a fertilized egg, into who we are today. Um, but the, the genetic material itself is, is not really that straightforward. We sometimes think of it as just kind of a long sequence of letters or numbers or codes. However you think about what DNA is, it's certainly more complicated than that. Um, the basic string of DNA is kind of here on the left side, very small, but it's actually wrapped around proteins, these things called histones, which form larger looped structures that are called nucleosomes that then fold into further looping structures that are, that are not at random. There's some variation, but they actually form very regularized domains of what we call chromatin. DNA is just the chemical that makes up the little string, but chromatin is the name that we give to all of these scaffolding proteins, the nucleosomes, everything that's kind of inside the nucleus that associates with DNA is all chromatin. And they're wrapped into these compartments. It's, it's quite well organized and it needs to be because there's so much of it and it's so complicated and you need to create a whole organism from these instructions. There's higher level organization to what's going on. It's important to keep that in mind. If we then zoom right in, we just look at the DNA, we look at the little string that's wrapped around the histones that's crushed into the nucleus. We can see uh, something you may have seen before that the double helix structure, if you, if you kind of unwrap the double helix, it just looks like a ladder. And these are the fundamentals. Uh, you have a, a backbone of the ladder, the kind of you know side posts of the ladder, which is called a phosphate backbone. And then you have these bases in between that make up the rungs. Oh, uh, there are letters that make up the sequence. They are A, T, C, G. If you've ever seen the movie Gattaca, that's why they gave the name Gattaca to the, the company that makes the spaceships that fly up. You know, it's very futuristic. It's all based on genetic perfection. It's G, A, T, T, A, C, A, Gattaca. Those are just the letters that they're names of the nitrogenous bases in DNA. Um, and and the way it works is is that uh, it, it's, it's kind of symmetrical or it's... Um, it's it's palindrome. It's I shouldn't say palindromic. It's symmetrical in the sense that uh, A always binds to T and G always binds to C. So on any given rung of the ladder, you'll always have if A is on one side, you'll have T on the other side, G and C. They bind together. They make up the ladder. That's this is actually the mechanism that allows for life in a lot of ways. Is the fact that you you have this mirroring of one side of DNA with the other side of DNA because it can self-replicate in that sense. If you have one half of it you can 
fill in the gap. Right? If you know what's on one side, you can just create the complementary side on the other and you have a double helix, you have, you have the two uh, sides of, of uh, DNA. So keep this in mind. And I think that we can therefore, because they're complementary, we can represent this sequence with only one string of letters, A, G, T, C, A, G, will always correspond to these letters on the other side. And now think about the fact that there's 3 billion of those in the genome across all of your chromosomes, 3 billion of those letters. And yet, you know, 99.9% .9 of that entire sequence is identical between every human. Um, so that's, you know, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, there are a lot of these figures that you see, you know, how much we share with chimpanzees and cats and bananas. It's always remarkable. Um, other organisms uh, tend to have different numbers of chromosomes, lengths of chromosomes, but uh, humans, we, for the most part, have the same. So I'm going to talk about this 0.1% uh, that's, that's different. And the 0.1% the specifically that's related to this thing I've talked about called the single nucleotide polymorphism. So what is that? Well, let's zoom in again. Here's a representation of a ladder. And if we just pick out one part in that sequence, we can see, oh, it's an A. And of course, that A is bound to a T. Now, we give names to positions in the genome. We can give a name to this particular position. It's an RS number. The SNP number is RS123. I've made that up, but we can say this is. Now, what we know from sequencing the genomes of many people, what we know about this position in the genome is that it could either be an A, and we're looking at the top strand here. Remember, it's complementary, so A is always going to bind to T. It can either be an A or a G. Well, here's a, it's an A, right? So if I'm looking in my cell, I have an A there. I'm like the A type. I'm A. But remember, we're diploid organisms. We have two copies of every chromosome in our body. So let's look at the other copy. Well, look, I have the G. So this is still just one of my cells, one of my nuclei. I mean, it'll be the same in all of my nuclei, but I've got two copies. What we say is that this individual, me, has an AG genotype at this location, at this SNP. It's also sometimes called heterozygous because you can only have one or the other. It's a, it's a or a G, and I've got one copy of each, right? What would it look like if we looked at a different position, right? Here's another position on, the, on our chromosome. It has a different RSID because it's a different location, RS456. It's a CA mutation, but I only have Cs. Both of mine are the same. They're identical. In fact, I am a homozygous for the C allele. We call these alleles. So I have two copies of the C allele at this SNP RS456, and I am heterozygous. I have one copy of each allele, the A and the G, at the first SNP. So a bit of terminology there. Uh, what could this mean, right? What could a change of one nucleotide, we call it, one letter difference in the genome, what could that go on to, to do? Well, there are several mechanisms, uh, but the, the main one that we often think about is that related to this idea of the central dogma. We have just discussed a change in the DNA sequence. That might influence the way that DNA replicates, right? This is actually what happens in cancer. You can have mutations arise in cells in your body that are constantly replicating, uh, like in bone marrow cells, for example. If you have a mutation that interrupts or causes an increase in replication of those cells, you may develop a tumor. You can also have changes uh, in DNA that affect other processes. One is called transcription, where you make a copy. Again, remember I told you how DNA is double helix, but it's complementary. So you can actually create a single strand version of DNA called RNA, which codes the same information as a segment of DNA. And then what happens is it leaves the nucleus, it goes into the cytoplasm, and it's turned into proteins. And proteins is what make up everything in our bodies, virtually. It's what creates our cell membranes. It's what you know, creates enzymes that participate in chemical reactions, it shapes who we are. Um, and a single change at the DNA stage can influence transcription. It can create more RNA, less RNA. It can change the pattern in this RNA strand, which changes the protein downstream. So we, we tend to think of this as the main way in which DNA variation can regulate or change downstream processes. So this is what I was taught in high school. Uh, things have moved on we do know that there are a lot of complexities in terms of how genetic variation of different kinds can influence a lot of things. Remember I told you about the complex structure of DNA, 
and chromatin and how it's kind of squished into these compartments. Well, a certain genetic variation can change the three-dimensional conformation of DNA inside the cell. It can change what's open. It can change what's closed. It can change all types of things. We're not going to get into it, but be aware that it's there's always something. But what's remarkable is that still this mechanism, this kind of basic DNA RNA protein cascade, still is by far the most prevalent model that's used in even very sophisticated analyses and explains a, quite a large amount of what's going on in terms of downstream disease risk that comes from DNA changes. So let's look back at uh, one of these SNPs, SNP RS123. And I know, because I'm looking at this on my screen, that I have an AG allele here, or I have AG genotype. Um, how did I know this? How can we measure this? These are very, very tiny molecules. Um, the process basically works as you get some biological material. If you've ever done 23andMe, you know you can take a cheek swab, get some kind of, uh, you know, um, cells off the inside of your cheek, or, or you can spit, you can get it from saliva, hair. Um, you get some DNA and you amplify it. You create more copies of it because there's not very much biological material in, in just a few cells. Uh, but we can amplify it through a process called polymerase chain reaction, and then we break it up. So you basically get a lot of DNA in some suspension. And then there's this step called hybridization. And, and the way this is, is there's actually these, these little black squigglies are uh, what we call oligonucleotides. They're like uh, single strand open versions of, uh, of DNA molecules, right? They're, they're kind of complementary little pieces. And because, uh, you know, I mean, the genome is so huge, but there's four letters, A, C, G, T, um, you can actually have a fairly small number of nucleotides in sequence, and it will be unique to one part of the genome. So all we need to do is design oligonucleotides that live in the places where we know SNPs are, right, at certain positions in the genome. And then you wash our actual DNA over it, and it will only bind to that place if it's that correct location of the genome, right? We add in labeled oligonucleotides, which are bits uh, that, that are, they actually have these uh, immunofluorescent dyes attached to them. And, and these, these labels have either a G, a C, a T, or an A attached to them. And what this means is that certain labels will only bind right, to your bit of DNA that's bound to an oligonucleotide if you have a certain single letter in that position. So imagine for our RS number, you have A, C, C, T, G, A, C, T, and then A instead of a G. Well, the label that has an A right, will bind. The label that has a G won't bind. So you'll end up with a different fluorescence on different parts of this, you know, it's basically a microchip that has these oligonucleotides on it. And, uh, and, and because of what binds and what doesn't, we know what letter you have in that position. You can show it in a slightly different way. Um, here we can see these oligonucleotides sticking up, and this kind of represents, uh, you know, where you, you would have a SNP. So in this case, you have a C, a C, and that allows these fluorescent dyes to bond there. And these are green dyes. So because you, you are homozygous for C, imagine you're homozygous for C, you have two C alleles. The only uh, fluorescence that you'll see is green fluorescence. You can imagine a totally different SNP, RS1108985. It can be a G or an A. And when we break up our DNA and wash it over and put the dyes on, we see both red and green, and it looks yellow. And that tells us that we have both copies, right? We have A and we have G. We're heterozygous. On the other side, we can have a different location, right? Another SNP that's only bound uh, at, at T. Again, we only see one color of dye, red. So we know that we have you know, homozygosity at this SNP for whatever the, the red dye is bound to, okay? So bear with me. If you know, we know there are millions of positions in the human genome of the three billion, many, many millions, in fact, hundreds of millions of positions where you can have these SNPs, we basically use, use microchip technology, tiny, tiny technology, little silica beads, and each bead represents one SNP. And so it's got those oligos that are specific to that part of DNA where we know there's a SNP. And then we have the binding of these labels so that we can tell, you know, who, you know, what genotype you have, or if you have a, you know, heterozygous or homozygous genotype. 
And then when you read it, it, it looks like this. It's optical technology, right? You shine a UV light onto the sample and read if it's red or green or yellow. Um, that's really it. And so here's an example on, on D of what that data looked like kind of coming out of the machine. This is just for one person. And this is kind of looking at an array of 650 SNPs. So 650 different positions in the genome. And you can see that this person has a bunch of SNPs that they're homozygous with one allele, a bunch where they're heterozygous. So you can see they have both the A and the B dye lighting up and then homozygous for the other dye. Now, of course, you can only make sense of which allele they have, if it's A, C, T, or G, if you have some reference, right? If you know that SNP1, for example, is an A to C and not a, you know, T to A or something like this. You, you have to be able to know that to map it onto these arbitrary green and red colors. But those are provided by the manufacturer because they design the array. Um, on the other side, we can look at one SNP and 95 different samples. And this is basically what genotype data look like you know, in a sample. You can see that you have this one SNP is RS2130185 and 59 people are homozygous for green, whatever green is and 28 are heterozygous and eight are homozygous for red. So clearly the red allele, whatever it is, is the rare allele in this population. Not so many people have two copies of it, uh, whereas 59 people have two copies of the other allele. And this is an example of the Illumina bead chip technology, which is used extensively today. What does this data look like when you finally get it, when you put it into your computer, uh, you know, you, you, you've gone through the machine, you've mapped it, it just looks like this. You have all of the study IDs in rows here, all of the participants in your, in your study. And then across the top, you have each SNP. So all these are location, each RSID. And we can see in the first column, you know, most people have two copies of G. Oh, look, somebody's got a GT heterozygous. Some of these are highly polymorphic, we'd say, like, you know, a lot of differences, A, 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 G, A, G, A, G, A, G, 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 certain SNPs. Other SNPs, like this one in the middle, kind of RS8140723, is all G, G. So, so seems that there, you know, whatever the other allele could be, very few people have it. So this is what the data look like. This is what goes into GWAS, except instead of here, eight columns, we could have hundreds of thousands or millions of columns. And as we saw from the current kind of, you know, state of the art of major depression, uh, GWAS, there were over 1.2 million subjects analyzed. So it's, it's a lot. That's when we talk about kind of, you know, genetics and genetic studies being big data is when you have, you know, 30 million SNPs by 100 or, you know, 1.2 million people. It's a lot of, it's a lot of data. You can't work with that in Excel. So how do we take that data and conduct a genome-wide association study? How do we turn that raw information about alleles and you know, different positions in the genome into workable knowledge about, about a, a disorder? Um, I'm not gonna discuss this. This is recommended reading. I'm putting it up. Remember, you can replay this presentation. We'll make the slides available. Really great summary of, of GWAS and, and kind of where we stand. Um, if we look back in time uh, to when D DNA, again, as, as a chemical, as a molecule was first isolated, which was well over 100 years ago, yeah, you know, 150 years ago, um, to when the, the structure of that molecule was identified in the, the 50s. And then the first sequencing of the human genome was in 2001. And the GWAS era kind of began in 2005. This figure is from a kind of review of age-related macular degeneration, but it was one of the first GWAS ever performed. So since kind of the mid thousands, 2005 and onward now, we've been performing genome-wide association studies. It's been made possible by technologies like this bead chip that I've shown, right? The ability to use little tiny silica beads with all these oligos and use microchip technology to simultaneously measure hundreds of thousands or millions of SNPs in, in a DNA sample. So it's, it's quite um, quite recent in the grand scheme of things. Uh, some people may say it's almost over. We can talk about this or it's coming to an end, but clearly, as I just showed you, I mean, the, the GWAS for major depression was published last month, I think, uh, or even, yeah, last month in June. It's, it's, still, it's still quite alive. 
Um, so, so what is what is the GWAS? Well, the, the fundamental idea is if we imagine we've taken one SNP, let's look at one given SNP, uh, and let's say that SNP can be uh, you know, C or a T. So some people have Cs and some people have Ts. Um, if we have a group of people, let's say a sample of 2,000 people, 1,000 of them are cases. In this case, they say people with heart disease. And in the other case, controls. We use the term controls to refer to people that don't have the condition of interest. Um, and so that's people without heart disease. All we have to do is look at the differences in frequency of these alleles, of the C and the T allele in these populations, right? So in this case, 62% of cases have a C allele and 38% of cases have a T allele. Whereas in the controls, it's almost 50-50. So, so this would suggest to us, hopefully it suggests to you, that whatever this single SNP is, the C allele might put you at risk for having heart disease, right? Just because it turns out that people who have heart disease are more likely to have at least one copy of this C allele. So this is literally, this is the fundamental idea of GWAS. The thing that makes this a genome-wide study as opposed to just a genetic study or an association study is that we do this for all of the SNPs that we've measured in the genome. So it's literally this analysis done millions of times with the same separation. You have cases and controls. This is one SNP. We look at the next SNP, the next SNP. The designs, you'll often hear about single stage or multi-stage. This has to do with the sampling. It has to do with where your data is coming from and how you're evaluating evidence for association. So I showed you that flow chart in the beginning of the most recent GWAS um, for, for major depression. You know, selecting what samples you're analyzing and how many you analyze them is important. So a single stage GWAS is a pretty flat test. You have just, like I showed you in that previous slide, a thousand cases, a thousand controls. Let's look at all the SNPs. Let's get some statistical measure of which ones are associated with the disease and which ones aren't. And that's it. The multi-stage is, is more of what we saw with major depression. It's virtually what all modern GWAS will be. You have a discovery sample, which is just like a single stage GWAS. You have replication phases. You separate the samples so that you can, you can test in a whole new set of, of individuals unseen if that finding replicates, if the same SNPs are associated and how strongly they're associated. And you can perform meta-analysis where you look at these phases together. Or you can perform meta-analyses of totally separate groups, right, from different uh, studies like the uh, Million Veterans Project or 23andMe. So they can become fairly complicated, but the goal with multi-stage is always to refine the, uh, either refine the results of the discovery phase GWAS or boost statistical power by meta-analyzing multiple cohorts and increasing the effective sample size. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these steps. Last year, we actually did go through these steps in the form of a tutorial. I didn't find it extremely informative or at least feedback suggested it wasn't. So we're not gonna go in depth on it, um, suffice to say, there are many steps. The goal here isn't to scare you. Um, the goal is to draw attention to a couple key areas and then also to provide this as a visual guide in case you want to come back and look at it or use the slide for your own uses. Um, after you've done this genotyping, which I told you how it's done, you get 400,000 to 2.5 million SNPs we've measured in all of our subjects, you have to perform quality control. You can quality control the variants and individuals. Um, Sometimes there's missing data. Sometimes people DNA samples are compromised. Sometimes people are, you can have twins. If, if you collect a sample of a million people from Canada at random, there's a chance that some of them are gonna be like very closely related to each other, might not even know it. So you know, sometimes you gotta remove these people. Uh, that can bias your analyses because then you have two people who are not independent. We'll talk about that. The one part I wanna draw your attention to is this process of imputation, which it kind of is after quality control. On the left side, you see when you genotype with these beta rays, you get you know up to 2.5 million SNPs. But I hinted at earlier is that we are aware of, we've studied the human genome now in large populations, and we've done full genome sequencing, just whole genome sequencing. I think Shrijoy will talk a bit about this in his session, where we don't just look at SNPs, we get the whole sequence. We get all 3 billion base pairs, not like 400,000 SNPs, 3 billion base pairs.
we we have an idea of there being close to you know 800 million SNPs in the genome, but we're only measuring you know four four hundred thousand or something, a few hundred thousand of them. So we have to use a statistical operation called imputation to actually try to fill in the gaps for those SNPs that we don't know. We, we use references for that, genome references. And then there's other quality control steps. There's the linear modeling, which I'll talk about, and then what we do with the data after the fact um, in terms of visualizing the results. I showed you the Manhattan plot, that kind of you know spiky, it looks like the, the skyline of Manhattan, which is why they call it, to show you which locations are associated with the disease. Um, for imputation, this used to be a really time-consuming, difficult thing to do. Luckily, um, you know, the, the folks in Michigan have made this much easier for everyone. And, you know, instead of having to learn all of these different, quite complicated concepts of haplotype phasing and, and using many different programs and downloading huge amounts of reference data to perform your own imputation, you can simply upload it to a server. It's free. You can register. And TopMed is the most recent uh, and highest quality and, and just, you know, best all around reference panel for genetic analyses. So don't panic. Um, and there's only 1,600 registered users right now. I think that that number should grow. But 1,600 people, you could be number 1,640. You know, if you want to do some imputation on a genetic sample, wouldn't that be exciting? So let's let's get to the kind of guts of what we're doing when we run the GWAS. I've shown you that kind of the basic idea is to look at these allele frequencies. You know, we're looking at how alleles are distributed differently between cases and controls. And you can run a GWAS on anything. It doesn't have to be case control. It can be something continuous, right? It can be something like height. Uh, it can be something like the level of a pathology, something like burden for Alzheimer's disease, you know, levels of amyloid protein in the brain, which is what kind of is thought to potentially cause Alzheimer's disease. Could be levels of, you know, white blood cell counts, you know, from, from lab tests. So the key to remember is that underneath the hood, all we're doing is taking those raw data that I showed you in like Excel format, right? Subjects and SNPs. And each SNP can really only be one of three things, right? You can have one of three genotypes. You're homozygous for one allele, heterozygous for one, or homozygous for the other, right? That's that's it. You can you can have those three values. Um, and and each of these tests is is performed individually, right? It's like we don't have to know what other SNPs are or what the effects of other SNPs are in order to do our association analysis at any given SNP. We can run them in parallel, if we so wish. Um, what we end up with, it, it, the basic framework on which most GWAS are built is linear regression. And I'm not gonna build in a full stats lesson on linear regression. I'm happy to chat about stats anytime. Um, love, I love stats. Uh, but for time and for getting through some of the other concepts that I think are important, I'm not gonna go into detail. What, what we're looking to get is for every SNP, for every test in our GWAS, we extract kind of three important things. One is called the beta coefficient for the effect on the outcome. So this, this tells us something about how much a change in your genotype, right? From having no copies of a C allele, for example, to one copy to two copies of C, right? How much does that change influence your likelihood of being a case, right, of having the disease? Or how much does it change your level of whatever it is we're modeling in our GWAS, right? White blood cell count, how much does it change? It gives you a number with a scale that actually tells you what that effect is. Then that estimate, because it is an estimate, it's statistics after all, this is a sample that we've collected and we're estimating what that true effect is, there's an error on that effect. Um, Sometimes it's reflected as, a, as, a, as just a value called the standard error or as confidence intervals in terms of, you know, how confident we are that the true value for that effect lies in some boundary. And then something called a p-value. Um, I realize that many of you won't have background in statistics. I hope you're familiar with what a p-value is. If you are interested in neuroinformatics and you're not aware of what a p-value is or you've never been exposed to it before, I strongly recommend that you start there with your learning. Um, in terms of fundamentals of, of exactly what it is, but you know, to to give a you know a, se a sentence on it, the p-value essentially summarizes the the probability 
that that beta coefficient that you observe, that effect that you observe in your statistical test is due to chance or not, right? That you would observe that same effect again if you repeated your experiment, you know, some number of times. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we can test either case control status or some continuous statistical measurement like height, something that's on a scale or right blood cell counts. In the case of a binary outcome, we still use linear regression really, but it's called logistic regression. You can't really draw a line through points. And it's kind of a typical scatter plot. Imagine we're modeling some continuous variable at an exposure on the x-axis. And now we have, you know, a case control status. In this case, Alzheimer's disease on our y-axis people are either Alzheimer's or not. Just like in our diagnostic summary, you're either major depression or not, your diagnosis, right? Your heart disease, yes or no. How do you model this? Those who enjoy stats among you might recognize that there are some difficulties with this type of modeling if you were to use regular regression, but we, we do it with a transformation of the Y variable. This is what the this name logistic regression comes from using essentially what is a transformation of the scale of Y into a plane that is restricted to values between zero and one into a probability space uh, rather than some continuous linear scalar space. You might be thinking, well, what does this actually look like for SNPs? So, you know, we're not talking about some continuous exposure. We're talking about genotypes, AA, AC, CC, right? Um, and also in the case of imputed SNPs, right? We may have started with maybe a million SNPs that we genotyped on our bead chip but then we went and imputed like 40, 50, 60 million SNPs. That's a statistical operation that, that's imperfect. We're guessing what the gaps are when we fill that in. So, so there's kind of imperfection there. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, what, what we actually do what most, most often is done is you, you then model genotype as a continuous variable, which is called genotype dosage. And you can think of dosage as just a number that ranges from zero to two and it just describes the number of alleles that you have for you know, an arbitrarily chosen allele. So in the bottom example, if there was some SNP that could be an A or a C, right? One location that's an A or a C, and we directly genotyped it, it's C allele dosages. The only values that anyone could have in our sample would be zero, one, or two, right? How many C alleles do you have? If we were interested in the A allele dosages, it would be the same, but inverted, right? It would be two, one, zero. So it's, it's just a way of turning this kind of, you know, categorical information of genotype into a number that we can use statistical methods for. And what that looks like is this, for our directly genotyped groups, remember, we know for sure, right? We, we've, we've actually looked at that. We said, okay, all these people have two A's and all these people have an AC and all these people have a CC. If our measured phenotype was a continuous one in this example on the y-axis, we could pretty confidently say that the dosage of C alleles was associated with an increase with whatever our phenotype is here. Right? Now, if this was just two groups, right? If it was like cases and controls, or, or, you know, our phenotype of interest, we, we could visualize, although it would be a little more challenging, that, that increased risk, right? C allele resulting in an increased risk. For imputed SNPs, there's actually, a, the, the dosage doesn't become discrete, right? The, there's a guessing game, a bit of a guessing game. For, for people here at this SNP that are somewhere in between one and two, it's because their particular genetic makeup, the SNPs that they had that were genotyped, don't provide perfect statistical information on, on you know, what, what they actually have at this imputed location. So we're not so sure what they have. It could be one copy or it could be two copies of the C allele. But generally, imputation is quite good. And then you can get a quality score, which just tells you basically how clustered these observations are around what's, you know, the known genotypes. So that's kind of what's happening under the hood. It's just a whole bunch of those tests that tell you how SNPs are associated with your phenotypes. Key considerations are sample size. It influences statistical power. There's been like an arms race for more subjects. Uh, included in studies of, of virtually every phenotype in, in GWAS. And like I said, now we're up to 1.2 million depression, which is supposed to grow. Um, minor allele frequency is important. So remember, if we look back at this, 
this is quite balanced, right? What this we can surmise from looking at this plot is that there's almost an equal number of people or quite a lot of people who have each of these three genotypes in our sample of 500 people, right? There's, there's a lot of information we're getting because we, we can look at where all these AAs are and ACs and CCs are. But what if A was really, really rare, you know? What if only a few people had two copies of A and you know tons of people had two copies of C? Well, that throws off the statistics, right? That means that we're, we expect a very few number of people with rare alleles to actually be informative in our study because we don't have enough to actually see what value they have, right? How do we know that two copies of a T allele, for example, having two copies of a really rare T allele is like certain to give you heart disease if nobody has two copies of that T allele, right? If it's rare, we, we can't we can't model it statistically. And then another major one is the phenotype distribution. So um, we talk about normality of residuals, which is just kind of a linear regression assumption. Um, there's ways around that for logistic regression. Really important is, is having enough cases in control. So just like our genotype frequency matters, we can't study a phenomenon. We can't study a case control status of something that nobody has, or just a few people have, because then who cares what the difference in genotype is between them? We have so few examples, right, that we don't get any confidence in our estimate of, of how many they are. So, you know, we saw earlier major depressive disorder, lifetime prevalence of 12, 15%. If you have a million people, you've got quite a lot of individuals, right, who, who will have that diagnosis, and we can look at the allele differences between them. So you have to be powered. Some challenges have led to methodological developments. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I want to put it on your radar and get you thinking about how things have moved forward to deal with these. So one of the issues is that you know, fundamentally ordinary regression methods assume something called IID, which is that the observations, these, the people in our study uh, are, are independent and identically distributed, right? The, the, um, the, the distributions of phenotypes and genotypes should follow very similar distributions. Um, and, and they can't be dependent on one another. You can't have sets of correlated observations. You don't want to have groups of people, right, uh, that have really, really similar genotypes for some reason, because uh, then they're simply not independent. And, and that's important for some kind of fundamental properties of statistical tests and, and hypothesis testing that we talk about. But intuitively, there are ways to think about how it can throw off your analysis. So the main ways in which this happens, and they've, they've plagued GWAS for a long time, is shared ancestry and cryptic relatedness. So shared ancestry would be um, you know, ma mainly constrained historically by geography, you have groups of people that are you know, relatively inbred, who just are, you know, the people on one continent or one island have to breed within groups, right? And there's migration events, and, and there is historical kind of, you know, uh, political regimes and, and events that have led to uh, ancestral lines moving in different ways. So you have large pieces, these kind of sections of DNA that people hold in common if they belong to a shared ancestry. And if you have disease-related genes on those segments, right, um, you, you may end up with a signal, we'd say a statistical signal that's associating this disease with a certain ancestral group or, or you know, just as, as a falsity of having an increased allele frequency because of shared ancestry. Cryptic relatedness is a very similar concept, but it's uh, much closer relations. It, it doesn't have to do with um, distant ancestry, more kind of closer relationships. Um, and then I mentioned this, major imbalances in case control sample size. This, this has to do with um, a, a property of how we actually, again, it's, it, has, it has to do with hypothesis testing. So when you have, for example, a beta coefficient um, in your linear regression model, how do you test statistically? How do you get a p-value from that example? How do you test if that effect that you observe is likely to be due to chance or if that's real, how much confidence you have in it? The ways we do that um, is, is often through what's called a score function, um, or you, know, you can test it against what's called a t-distribution of kind of a, an expectation of where that beta coefficient should lie as we, we transform it by the standard error. So there are assumptions basically that are built into how we evaluate whether or not a beta coefficient and its standard error are significant. And the, those assumptions break down um, quite a lot. They break down when you have imbalances in case controls, when you have very few people with a certain disorder and a ton of controls, 
It also breaks down when you have rare variants. Whenever you have skewed distributions of values of your variables, those assumptions break down. You know, the best way to deal with it, one of the best ways is something called permutation. Um, but as, and again, those stats, you would know to permute, you basically have to rerun the analyses a huge number of times and shuffle the data every time to try to understand the probability of your result being, you know, real. Um, there are better ways to deal with uh, with that. There are other types of assumptions that we can use. So instead of using a normal distribution to get this, we can use something called a saddle point estimate um, and to deal with the fact that um, the uh, populations that we're looking at now that they're actually quite big may have cryptic relatedness, may have ancestral um, kind of uh, confounding or relationships within them. We can use slightly more or, um, uh, sophisticated methods to actually handle that in our modeling. So uh, this is a method called SAGE. Uh, it was developed by a, a, a group, including a, an old colleague of mine. Um, and it's basically a framework for running GWAS that is not the kind of basic running a bunch of linear models. They use a linear mixed model, which accounts for possible correlation between subjects, right? Cryptic relatedness and ancestry. And it also uses this uh, saddle point approximation, SPA, um, to kind of better get a sense of how significant our effects are over just a, uh, an, a normal approximation of where our effects should lie. And that helps deal with the imbalances in cases and controls that we actually see a lot in big population data sets. And there's one more concept that is really important and I wanna go over briefly before talking about polygenic risk and how we kind of synthesize these data and how we can use them possibly in, in a clinical setting. And that's linkage disequilibrium, which is something you will hear about uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about genetics, if you ever work with this data. Here we can look at a, a Manhattan plot, and we've seen a couple of these so far. Uh, this is the results of a hypothetical GWAS. Notice the, the peaks and valleys, right? It's not a random distribution. And the SNPs here that are really significant at the top seem to have tails, right? Almost like, like comets flying through the skies. So what's all that about? Um, well, we can, we can zoom in on one of these peaks and, and get a sense of what's going on. So here we've picked a, a locus, a region of the genome on, on chromosome three. And here's the, the most significant SNP in this region, RS11385942. Okay, we can see that there's a number of genes in this area that are kind of, you know, nearby. But look at all these other SNPs that are, that are associated and notice how there's kind of a pattern to them, right? There's like a top shelf that are all fairly significant and there's a second shelf and there's all these tiers. This arises from the fact that DNA is not passed on one nucleotide at a time. Um, every time a, uh, a sperm is generated or the generation of eggs, uh, you have a process called meiosis, which involves uh, what's called crossing over of chromosomes. You have a shuffling of genetic material to decide what goes into that sex cell, right? What does your new version of chromosome three look like? It's not a shuffling at the single level, it's a shuffling of segments of DNA. It's segments or haplotypes that are passed on through generations. So you imagine, you know, again, you're the product of a mixture of your father's and mother's DNA. You have this shuffling of, of, of segments that are passed on and increasingly shuffled through generations as you become more and more dissimilar to your ancestors. Um, but those blocks we refer to as haplotype blocks. And, and we can basically get a sense of this, you know, a perfect equilibrium would be two SNPs located on different chromosomes, right? Where they aren't even on the same molecule. So, you know, they could be passed on from mother or father at random, they can be shuffled in different ways. But um, there's, there's often, especially as you get closer and closer on the genome, you know, on, on a single chromosome, as you find positions closer and closer, there's a higher probability that they will be inherited as a unit. Uh, and we call that disequilibrium, right? It's a, a lack of random shuffling of alleles in the population, which we can measure by just looking at how alleles are correlated with each other in the population, right? If we know what your genotype is at this SNP, can we, can we guess or impute your genotype at a SNP right next to it? It's possible if they're in linkage, right? If they're linked. If the SNP is really far away and they're kind of shuffled through generations, we probably can't guess, 
right? And, and that's important because it brings up an idea of whether or not what we're seeing in a GWAS is causing the, the illness is actually the causal variant, or if it's just in linkage with the variant that's causal. Another way to think of it and look at it is, imagine we've genotyped, we've, we've measured this SNP, maybe we've imputed it, this, this SNP, and we observe an association with our phenotype. We can say it's major depressive disorder. Well, let's say that there's linkage, right, between this genotype SNP that we had and the actual true causal locus, right? A different SNP. And it turns out mechanistically, right, let's say because this unobserved SNP is the one that's, you know, changing the protein structure of this gene and, and actually, you know, influences your risk in a, in a concrete molecular way, we are only guessing, we're only getting part of the effect that's due to linkage disequilibrium through our observation. This other gene may go totally unrecognized because it's in linkage. It's very difficult to tease those signals apart. Th this is kind of what it looks like. If we pick a segment of chromosome, each one of these red boxes shows a correlation in a population of how correlated these SNPs are with each other. And you see they form these, these blocks, right? These regions that are tightly correlated within each other. And here there's kind of four blocks that are identified. Maybe there's another block here, kind of a long range block in the middle. Um, but you see from very far away, the SNPs that are really far away are not correlated with each other in the population, right? People who have an AG here doesn't give us any information as to what they might have on the other side of the spectrum. They're not correlated. Um, so always be thinking about this, there's, there's ways of getting over this through fine mapping, through layering onto other types of data like transcriptomics, which we'll talk about, looking at what these SNPs do at the functional level, which is really important after a GWAS, because who are we to say that the strongest statistical association that we've seen is causal? It may be causal. These all may be in linkage, or maybe the causal SNP is just not as statistically significant because of just chance of heterogeneity in our phenotype of the sample that we have. So we very rarely can infer, I mean, we, we can't infer causality based just on statistical significance in our genes. So finally, what can we do with this information? Um, and, and this is a term that you'll see a lot, polygenic risk. We've just seen how, uh, we can map essentially, you know, using this GWAS method, uh, all of the regions and all of the SNPs that might be uh, associated with a trait or associated with a risk for a disease or something like this. We, we get all these beta coefficients for millions of positions. What can we do with it other than kind of learn something about the genes that are in that region, right? Pinpoint the locus, understand what part of the genome it is and, and, and learn about the biology of disease. We might be able to do more and, and the goal of a polygenic risk score is to distill or kind of reduce the, the dimensionality of genotype information that each one of us has across the entire genome into one number of risk, right? We use the map we get from GWAS, we use our genotype data that we have, you know, from our cheek swab or whatever else, and we boil it down to one number that says, you know, do you have a high risk, right? A genetically determined risk for something like taller or shorter height, right? Or, you know, increased risk for developing major depression, right? We can do this using this information. And just to clear up some nomenclature, you'll sometimes hear them as referred to polygenic risk scores, genetic risk scores, polygenic score. Just keep in mind when you're talking about it, anytime you use the word risk, you know, a polygenic risk score, it's assumed that a higher score, you know, the score is indexing something that has a negative valence, right? It's risk for something like risk for a disease, uh, but we can develop scores for any phenotype. And the UK Biobank uh, has released a set of summary statistics. They've run over 7,000 GWAS on different traits, virtually everything. They have a GWAS to tell you if you're more or less likely to use almond milk in your cereal in the morning. Like, no joke. Um, you know, what that means is up to you. Uh, but, you know, that's hardly a risk score. I don't know if you feel like using almond milk is risky. Um, I guess it's bad for the environment. It could be bad for the, especially with the droughts. Uh, so think about the word risk and how we use it in polygenic scoring, but it's just it's just semantics. So how do we do it? Well, again, here's a hypothetical result from a GWAS. Um, in this case, I've drawn lines on the Manhattan plot, and these lines are used to determine, these are kind of arbitrary thresholds. They they tell us, you know, uh, because the, the scale is is a negative log, so it's a negative logarithm, you see this on, on, this, on the left side, the higher the dot, 
the smaller the p-value, the more significant that association is. It's just a transformation to make things look easier. Um, if you uh, make a cutoff, this one at top is a p equals 5 times 10 to the negative 8. This is a very traditional old and somewhat out of date, but it's still used, um, definition of what we consider to be genome-wide significant. Um, and and above this line, would you have a p-value that's smaller than this, and you'd call it genome-wide significant. So let's say in this GWAS, we don't have any genome-wide significant loci, that's fine. Let's pick another threshold, 1 times 10 to the negative 5. We have four SNPs that were significant. Um, let's take a look at them. These are their RS numbers. Okay, we know what they are. Okay, these are their summary statistics. Um, this is what we get from like a GWAS. This is, you know, you'll hear about GWAS summary stats. This is what you get. You get, okay, this SNP, allele one and allele two. These are the two alleles that you could have. And remember, we're talking about allele dosage, right? How many copies of an allele result in some effect, some risk, some change, right? The beta coefficient. Well, these are often organized as A1 being the effect allele in this case. These statistics are oriented to the A1 column. So what we can infer from this is if you have one copy of the A allele at this location, you have a beta coefficient or a change in your Y, whether it's a risk for something or a change in some phenotype of 1.2. So your whatever it is, you can say risk for MDD goes up by some value if you have a copy of A, it's a risk allele and the associated p-value and standard error is what we get. So what about the subject data? Um, we've seen this before a couple times too, right? All of the individuals in our study who have been genotyped, and here are the actual raw data for these locations. But we can, we can map them onto each other, right? So one, these are totally separate sources of data. One of them is like summary results from a genome-wide study the other one is a data set. It could be a totally new data set, totally new group of people. All we have to do is orient ourselves. Well, let's pick this first SNP, right? RS598765. We know the A allele is the risk allele because it has a positive beta coefficient or it's increasing something. So let's just add up the number of risk alleles that each person has. You know, the first person doesn't have any A, so zero plus zero equals zero. The second person has one A, so they have a value of one. This is, this is arithmetic. So this is basically the summary of risk that we're getting for that SNP for each person. We go to the next SNP, do the exact same thing. This risk allele is a T. So how many T's do you have? Let's add it up, let's go down. Oh, subject three has two copies of T. So they've got a two for their risk, right? And, and just fill it in, right? Do the same for the other SNPs. And let's add it up. This is what makes it polygenic, right? Instead of just looking at one SNP, which might have to do with one mechanism, in fact, could be on a totally different chromosome than these other SNPs. Remember, we selected them by taking a p-value threshold. We add them up. This is now a polygenic, multiple genes, cross the genome score that summarizes the risk that these SNPs had for whatever the outcome was in our GWAS. And we can make things a little friendlier by dividing these scores by the total number of SNPs that we had. And now we have distilled information for these SNPs, these locations into this single score, and we can rank risk based on that. Can we improve? Yes, we can. And there's a couple ways in which this is done. Number one, we can raise the p-value threshold to include more SNPs. You can raise and lower it. You change the p-value threshold. We can do this all day, right? We're dividing this sum by the number of SNPs. We can include four SNPs. We can include 40. We can include 400, 4,000. We can then also take into account the strength of the effect, the beta coefficient. This is weighting. This is really important because there are different ways in which we can weight each SNP. So let's take a look at what this would look like. Let's include some more SNPs in our score. There were our threshold before. Well, let's take another threshold. How about one times 10 to the negative four? Well, now we've got 53 SNPs in our score, okay? But the process works the same way. We take all those 53 SNPs and go through the same procedures we've just seen. Now we can also weight by the effect. So rather than the PRS just being a, a uh, summing of the number of risk alleles at each locus, it's the summing of the number multiplied by how strong the effect of that SNP was. Right? And that's important. Some SNPs are more important than others. Look at the summary stats again. The beta coefficient for these, they're not the same, right? A SNP that has a, a dosage effect of 1.2 is not as important for this phenotype as one that has a 0.2. 
a, a beta coefficient of 1.6, right? The change is greater if you have the allele. So we can work it in. And, and again, it's just arithmetic. We've done this again. Let's add up the number of risk alleles just like we did before. And let's multiply now that number by the actual beta coefficient or the strength of the association, some weight that tells us which how important that SNP is. You see, now we have a bit more of a fine-grained thing going on. Let's do it for the next SNP. We add it up just like we did before. Let's multiply by the beta coefficient. You can see now those contributions are not equal. Before, they were the same. If you had one copy of A or T of the two, we've, we've added in this nuanced effect to, to weight by the beta coefficient. And let's follow the same procedure as before. Uh, for all of the SNPs that we have, these are just four, but imagine we could go on for 53, 100. And then divide by the total number of SNPs and we get a score. And you can see by, by weighting things, we have kind of increased our ability to differentiate risk between people. And also we're getting a more accurate sense of, uh, you know, of what the true risk is because we're taking into account the differences between genetic effects. So, you know, in, in the first case, there were many ties for ranks when we didn't weight the score. But when we rate, when we actually apply the weighting to the score, we can, we can much more easily differentiate. There are no ties for, for risk in our population. Key considerations are resolution. So how many SNPs we include, they, that can be important. Uh, and there, there are different ways that we can go about selecting the number of SNPs, right? We can choose based on a p-value, right, how many SNPs to include. But of course, we can choose that arbitrarily, and we might actually overfit our model. If we're interested in calculating a score and associating it with something else, how do we know what the optimal number of SNPs is to choose? There, there are different ways to do this. Um, there are also certain parameters that we have to deal with to handle LDs. Remember, I mentioned this idea of LD, right? Groups of SNPs are inherited together. So what if we take, you know, a p-value threshold and we have that tail of significant SNPs that are all in the same haplotype block, we don't want to count them all multiple times, right? We're adding up this risk. What if we had like a hundred SNPs that were all in linkage with each other and we add up, you know, all of their beta coefficients in your score? It's like we're double dipping, triple dipping, you know, a hundred times dipping. We're doing a lot of dipping and and, and we don't want that. We have to deal with the fact that there's LD structure. We, we remove, you know, we only count each independent region once. So we have to consider that. And then a big one, which is related to LD, is ancestry. Um, if we've performed our genome-wide association study in one ancestral group, right, people of a certain ancestry, and then calculate the score in another, um, we're not actually getting an accurate sense of, of risk in that population because the first, our entire GWAS is based on the allele frequencies across the genome of all of our SNPs and those that are associated with our disease, right? And the LD structure, right? In that population, which is different. The LD structure and haplotypes are different depending on our ancestral groups. And I'm gonna show an example of that so you can kind of think about it intuitively. Um, here's an example of resolution, kind of first issue. So if I, in this, kind of example I gave, we calculate a polygenic score with a threshold of, you know, very low threshold of five to the negative eight. And this is real data actually for Parkinson's disease. Um, and we uh, show a histogram on the bottom, the distribution of this score with just four SNPs. You can see it's quite almost discrete, right? The, the reason for this is if you only have four SNPs and you can only have three genotypes at each SNP, you can kind of just through arithmetic, arithmetic, think about you can only have a certain number of values when you add them up because, because it's all discrete. You have a very few number of SNPs. If you have more SNPs, suddenly that resolution of the score increases because you have more opportunities for different people to have different alleles at those variants, right? You have more chance for people to be differentiated by whether or not they have a SNP that someone else doesn't have. And if you go up to 22 and, and on, you can see the distribution smooths out. It becomes more and more normally distributed. And indeed, in population samples with large numbers of SNPs, it's a hallmark of polygenic risk scores that they tend to be quite normally distributed. Um, and that distribution will shift depending on if you have a high risk population or a low risk population, very subtle shifts. Um, ancestry is key. I show this slide because there just aren't many GWAS available in non-European ancestry samples. This slide is a little out of date. Unfortunately, things haven't changed enormously, although there are a few um, ongoing studies that we'll learn about next week. 
that are actively intending, well, they're actively recruiting individuals and, and, and you know, they have a purpose to gather non-European ancestry uh, data. And there's a lot of challenges with this, um, uh, but it's very important. So I'll show you why it's important. Um, this is an example of uh, a data set. Each point here is a person of 2,500 people from something called the Thousand Genomes Project Phase 3. So this was a, a project to, uh, to, to sequence the genomes of 2,500 people from different unique populations across the world. So um, you have kind of African populations, uh, you know, you can, you can see the definitions here, you, uh, Yoruba, uh, Kenyan, uh, Gambia, Sierra Leone, down here in the bottom left, CEU, which is kind of Caucasian, European, uh, Italian, Finnish, and then um, kind of East Asian, Sri Lankan, um, the, everything's on a spectrum. The visualization you're looking at here is, is comes from a principal components analysis. It's a way of taking all of the SNPs in someone's genome and looking at how similar people are to each other and projecting that into a two-dimensional space. So this just makes the point that you know, different geographically and, and culturally isolated parts of the world tend to share genetic information. And we can quantify that with this plot. Let's now superimpose a new group of individuals, 2000 people from a study out of Chicago called the Religious Order Study Memory and Aging Project. You can see that this is not a very diverse sample, right? This, we can, we can see that all of the subjects in here, although there, there are differences in terms of kind of proportions of different types of ancestry they may have due to their haplotypes, there are no people in it with an African, uh, with, of African descent or of East Asian descent. Um, this was done on purpose actually for this analysis because as you'll see, it can create issues in genetic analysis. And I've mentioned this in GWAS, different allele frequencies arising from ancestral patterns can bias the effects that you see in SNPs. Um, Here's an example of a polygenic score analysis that I will show you is dramatically confounded by ancestry. On the y-axis, we have a score calculated for Alzheimer's disease. On the x-axis, one for Parkinson's disease. So you might look at this and say, wow, you know, there is a striking negative relationship between the risk for Alzheimer's disease and risk for Parkinson's disease in this sample. Um, let's look a little bit closer um, here's the same uh, ancestry visualization, but this is this, this same sample. It's from a sample called the IMVAR sample, 692 people. It's quite a diverse sample. Some people are of African ancestry, some of East Asian. Let's now color the points by that ancestry and look at the patterns within. As you can see, this negative relationship does not really hold in all these populations. In fact, there's no association in those of African ancestry. Um, and the distribution of the value of the Parkinson's disease score and indeed the Alzheimer's disease score is almost entirely explainable or very largely explainable by which ancestry you belong to. So this one drawing a line through all of them will really bias things. And you can see that these are the distributions of the Parkinson's score. They have different values. And this is because the alleles that are counted toward risk for this score have different allele frequencies due to uh, various um, kind of, um, you know, geographical and, and uh, migratory events in history and, and patterns of shared ancestry. Uh, I want to draw you attention right before I finish to the fact that what I've shown you and the way that the score was constructed in terms of, um, you know, uh, dealing with LD and counting the number of SNPs you have and adding up risk and choosing p-values, you know, at a certain threshold and including SNPs. That's, that's called, it's, it's often called a clumping and thresholding um, uh, approach. And it was kind of the first that was developed and it's still by far the most common that's used. Uh, but there are a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of um, other methods that have come out. This is a recent example. Um, see, this is, yeah, this is the wrong citation. I apologize for that. I'll get the right citation in. Um, I think this was, this is in the biological psychiatry. I'll, I'll post the correct information for this, but this is a really nice benchmarking of different methodologies that operate in different ways. They select SNPs in different ways, they deal with LD in different ways, and they weight the SNPs in different ways. So they kind of tried to give you an idea of those are the key things. It's always about how do we weight SNPs? How do we deal with linkage disequilibrium? And how do we select which SNPs go into the score? And these methods all 
deal with that in different ways. And their performance um, for actually differentiating between cases and controls, right? If we calculate a polygenic score in a new population of people and you wanna know, hey, how good is that score at telling me who does or doesn't have a disease? How good is it at predicting risk? Uh, there's varying performance. They're all quite similar, although generally this clumping and thresholding seem to perform worse. There's reasons for that that we can talk about. Finally, there's really nice analyses that, are, that have just been published in, in last month again, where you're kind of testing different methods for polygenic scores, different sources of GWAS summary stats and different ways of um, verifying and getting kind of external validity for how good these scores are at predicting traits in unseen people these are, these are being developed, mostly using UK Biobank statistics at the moment um, because it's such a large, deeply phenotyped sample and, and we'll talk about these resources in later days. Um, but these frameworks are being developed that are really quite nice and, and a kind of a tease to uh, what I'll talk about a little bit in, in my kind of integrative uh, sessions next week. If you, this is the same study, you look to say if you calculate a score, polygenic score for depression, and then you know, use that score in, in, a, in a new sample of people, right? People who weren't in the original GWAS and try to predict who has depression and who doesn't, try to classify them. Uh, you don't actually do that well. So AUC is a measurement that kind of uh, gives us our ability to, um, to, to classify people into one group or another um, in this test. And, and a, a value of 0 0.5 is equivalent to, to chance to just flipping a coin and deciding who's in which group. And you can see for depression, the value is about 0 0.6. It's not horrible, not nearly as good as a polygenic score for something like heart failure, prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, atrial fibrillation. And the, the tease is that when you include um, extra variables, information on lifestyle, information on uh, demographics and ancestry and and information on other risk factors for depression, you don't actually improve the model very much at all, just over 0.6. This is a methodological concern. But anyway, that's um, that's it for me. That's kind of where we're at in terms of testing polygenic scores in, in these populations. So I'm going to unfocus the screen for a second and come back into view. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes before the break, and I want to give you the full break um, before we start again at 10.45. Um, I see there's been some nice chatting going on, and a lot of people have been answering questions and providing uh, resources for others, which is really great, and I really appreciate that. But I'm going to go into these questions quickly um, uh, and and kind of address the top. So with the top voted one here is about imputation servers. So I'll start answering this. Could you talk a bit more about the imputation servers? Is top med better than Michigan imputation server? What are the differences? Um, your PIs had some concerns about submitting data to these servers due to security, privacy, right? Any comment on that? So um, the, the top med server is, is also built from uh, University of Michigan. It's, um, they're, they're the same, uh, but I believe that top med is also I mean, TopMed is built from, it's NIH funded, um, and they were in partnership with the Sanger Institute, which is funded by Wellcome Trust. I actually don't know how the relationship works right now. The TopMed imputation server is just an evolution of the Michigan imputation server. Uh, so it is it is better, it is, it is newer. It just has newer versions of reference panels and uh, haplotype phasing software in it and the actual impute software. So you used to be able to choose between like Match and Impute2 and um, and Beagle, and, and they've just upgraded it to like Impute 4, I think, and, and other uh, better uh, versions of those, of those programs. In terms of security, um, you know, I can tell you that I would have no reservation whatsoever submitting my own personal data to, to this server, uh, and I've, I've done that. Um, it's really, it's, it's tough because, you know, genotype data is sometimes seen as personal health information because it's really detailed. Technically, you could identify people based on DNA, but DNA is pretty useless 
Uh, there's one study that would argue otherwise, actually, but the DNA is fairly useless without any attached information. When you upload your data to these servers, you're not including metadata. You're not giving it information about sex, about um, age, about occupation or case disease status, right? No other information. It's just genomes and your file names. Uh, and you don't even have to include any X or Y chromosome data, right? You can include one section of one chromosome and have it imputed. So personally, I see the potential risk of, of a breach, even if a stranger got a hold of those genomes to be quite, I don't know what they would do with it really. Um, but it is a concern because, you know, it's, it's not completely dismissible, put it at that, but I don't have personally concerns about it. Um, and I'm not aware of any cases where there's been any security or privacy breach with an imputation server in history. I, I just, I don't think it's ever happened. Um, the next question is about uh, learning more about GWAS so you can perform it yourself. So you can look back at some of the slides that I've had and I've given some, and it looks like Talisa, thank you, has already posted some really great uh, resources and tutorials. Um, there's there's a ton of great information. The two articles that I would, uh, one that I would start with is Anderson 2010, which I, I, I kind of cite as recommended reading up above, which is still probably the, the most clear, um, you know, laying out of quality control steps and everything for running GWAS. Um, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of new resources out there. And, and often the best place to go is actually the, the website for the software that runs it. So if you go to uh, Plink, P-L-I-N-K, which is kind of the, the most commonly used uh, tool for manipulating and analyzing genetic data, they have tutorials, right, on how to run genome-wide association study using their tools, um, just like SAGE does, right, the kind of uh, a bit more sophisticated method that I showed, SAGE, or HAIL, which is also one that's used for very large-scale data sets. Uh, one more, I think, um, it's quite a few questions I can, I can address quickly. Um, so when comparing two populations in terms of their PRS, the European is usually much more than Africans. What's your thoughts on overcoming this? So yeah, unfortunately, um, the only real way to overcome it is to um, develop more data on these populations and, and let that's being done. Um, it's, it's being done and the studies that are analyzing those data set in the context of GWAS are finding that when you incorporate data from diverse populations, it was always feared that when you look at multiple ancestries in the same analysis, you're diluting your sample and you are losing power because you're looking at these heterogeneous populations. It's turning out that it's actually the other way around. When you incorporate information, especially from African populations, which have much higher genetic diversity than any other population on the planet, you increase power in your GWAS, you increase the ability to identify causal variants because you're you're picking up on a, a higher diversity of, of haplotype blocks that you don't usually find in European populations. So there are a few other questions. I don't wanna run all through this time. I'm gonna jump into Gather Town. So if you'd like to answer, there's a question about triallelic SNPs, um, haplotype blocks, we can chat about these all day. We can chat about them at lunch as well, but I wanna give the time up for you for break and not take out of any of um, Treejoy's time. Uh, and also you can come at me on uh, on Slack, in our, in our KCNI Slack group. And yeah, uh, enjoy your break and uh, we'll see you back here for Transcriptomics, a very exciting session coming up. Uh, thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you, see you soon.